Happy New Year to you, Lynn. I know it's end of January, but Happy New Year. You too. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> Thank you for having you back. You, we would. Ha- I would have you back. I'd have you on every show if I could. It'd just be you and me <laughs> making 13 shows a month <laughs> if we could prep it. But no, I'd always have you back. Um, and it was nice to do one in person, hang out, get some dinner and to do in person. So hopefully we'll get to do that again this year. I'm, I'm going to see you hopefully in Miami. Is that right? Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll meet up a couple times this year. Yeah, fingers crossed. Right, uh, fairly calm January, really. <laughs> oh well, well, I mean, it's. I think it's. I saw a data point that the S and P five hundred had one of its biggest, uh, you know, down moves to start a year in history. Uh, even though it's so far, it's wow. a pretty small move, but it's been so compressed to the very beginning of the year, uh, and it's something where. You know, to my research subscribers, I was talking about you know being more defensive as they look out in 2022. Uh, but of course, I didn't foresee necessarily how front loaded that would be. That basically a lot of that unwind would happen kind of early on. So we've we've certainly had a lot of market turbulence both in Bitcoin and in in broader markets, especially U.S. markets. I mean, emerging markets have held up better, uh, but it's been a very kind of U.S. focused and and you know risk assets, Bitcoin, uh, all coins getting you know they're going down even more. So it's kind of been this risk off period. Well, so let's talk about this article you wrote, uh, The Capital Sponge, and I'm going to say what I say all the time, which you tell me not to, is that people should go to your website and they should read it and they should also sign up to your newsletter because it's scandalously cheap to sign up to. Um, but uh, yeah, The Capital Sponge, um, where you were warning basically that the US equity market is a bit too big and we could be looking at a reversal. Well, what was the background to this? Well, the background for this is it kind of relates to what we just discussed before about the petrodollar system. That, that's kind of the, the core of the engine, but there's other moving parts as well. And essentially what is the case is, you know, each each market kind of focuses on their priorities. And the U.S. is really kind of focused on on its on making its equity market attractive uh, at the cost, the cost of other things. So we kind of, you know, we 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 weaken the power of our labor. Uh, so that that was beneficial to corporate profit margins. Uh, we really kind of emphasized the offshoring more than a lot of other developed countries did. And by having the petrodollar system, meaning that we run these structural trade deficits with the rest of the world, uh, they need you know they they get all these dollars in order to buy energy. And what they do with a lot of their surplus dollars is they put them back into U.S. markets. So we run a a trade surplus, but a capital uh, a trade deficit, but a capital account surplus. So that capital flows back into our markets. And historically, a lot of it went into treasury markets, um, but those have become less attractive over time, uh, and, and fewer entities are out there buying large amounts of treasuries. And instead, we've seen a lot of these these you know so- foreign sovereign wealth funds, foreign pension funds, uh, foreign central banks actually go ahead and buy U.S. equities. And so a lot of capital just pours into U.S. equity markets and bids them up to very very high valuations. And that can sound like a good thing. I mean, it can sound like a good thing to have foreign markets like your equity market and want to buy it. But another way to describe that is that we are running these trade deficits. So we're buying, you know, depreciating consumer goods from China and elsewhere. And in exchange, we are selling our our appreciating assets, things like our stocks, our companies, our land, um, to to the foreign market because they're, you know, they're getting all these dollars from that trade deficit. And so it's really kind of been a problem for U.S. labor, uh, and it's been a, a problem for you know parts of the United States. But it's been very strong for our equity market. And the concern there is that you know if you map out these kind of the history of global capital flows, right now there's a lot of capital really stuffed into U.S. markets, um, and it, we've not really seen this level of concentration since roughly the dot com bubble. Uh, there's just you know there's just so much global capital. So Americans are underweight foreign assets compared to their history. Uh, so they're, you know, Americans are very focused on U.S. markets. They have the highest ever allocation to U.S. equities as a percentage of their assets than they've ever had. And at the same time, foreign markets are very overweight U.S. assets, especially U.S. equities. Uh, and so we, we have somewhat dangerous conditions, in my view, in terms of valuations, especially as we see the Fed kind of talk about pulling back on stimulus and as we see fiscal stimulus uh, getting gridlocked and pulling back as well. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of risks, uh, at least for, you know, we've seen kind of U.S. capital markets go straight up over the past 18 months. And I think that that, that is somewhat behind us now. And for, for me to understand, is this uh, is, is this kind of pushed and been good for white collar workers, but at the cost of blue collar workers? Exactly. And especially the upper echelon of white collar workers. 
Um, and so it's been it's been basically the way. I, so the way I would describe it is, let's say, um, let's say we we had a global currency. Like let's say let's say it's the past, and I'm pricing my products and services in grams of gold, right? And so I I make machinery. Uh, you're over in another country. You make a sim- You're my competitor. You make a similar machinery, and we price it in grams of gold, right? So, if if something happens and say let's let's say there's a natural resource discovery in my country, right? It does not in any way impact uh, the fact that I'm selling this machinery in grams of gold. There's there's no kind of impact on my business. However, if we instead are selling our machinery in our in our currencies, uh, including to a global market, and let's say there's a gigantic natural resource discovery in my country, right? So we start exporting a ton of oil. Well, that's going to basically improve our trade surplus and it's probably going to strengthen our currency. And so it's actually going to make, you know, my my exports, my machines are now more expensive for most of the world to buy compared to your machines. And the problem is that because, you know, my employees are paid in, in that currency, my liabilities are denominated in that currency, it's harder for me to cut my prices in this currency to compete with you. Mm. And so I, Ironically, having a strong currency, at least not not fundamentally, not in say a, a, a universal account system, but in the specifically fiat currency system, having a stronger currency, especially if it's nothing I did, if the, if this other oil discovery is the thing that's leading to this currency strength, that can really mess up my competitiveness. Uh, and so that's that's a the term is known as Dutch disease. The Economist t- coined that term. Basically, that's what happened in the Netherlands decades ago. They had this gigantic natural gas discovery. And it, it, you know, it's it's one of those things where the the term is basically used for something where it sounds like a good thing, but it actually damages other industries because their currency becomes, you know, stronger and it, it reduces their competitiveness. And the United States basically did that with the petrodollar system. So instead of discovering uh, oil and gas uh, around, you know, the 1970s, what we did was we discovered, quote unquote, discovered the treasury, right? So we basically made this artificial system where everybody in the world needs treasuries. If they want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, we made a deal with Saudi Arabia and the rest of OPEC and said only sell oil in dollars. It makes it makes it so that every country in the world that needs to import dollar import oil needs dollars. And so we basically created this artificial demand for dollars. And so any business that wants to export something that has margins and that you know really wants to make things is is less competitive if they're in America, unless they're just particularly good. I mean, it's not doesn't it doesn't make you so you're you can't compete, but it just makes it harder to compete. Um, and the ones the businesses that do really well are like the high margin, low capital intensive, low labor intensive businesses. So software, finance, healthcare businesses that can offshore those keep doing well, but blue collar workers really become uncompetitive. And then we also you know the United States has the highest per capita healthcare cost in the world by far. Um, despite the fact that we don't really have better outcomes. And that puts a lot of pressure on employers as well because they're the ones uh, generally paying for a large chunk of that health care, uh, at least for the you know working age population. And so for a variety of reasons, we've structured our policy in such a way that is very conducive to our capital markets. We, we run these gigantic trade deficits and all those dollars come back into our equity markets and prop up valuations, uh, which is great for the top 10% of the population that owns 89% of equities, including me, uh, but it's really bad for blue collar workers uh, that are trying to compete in this global market, and you know, let alone getting out competed by cheap emerging markets, they're getting out competed by other developed peers in Germany, in Japan, in Switzerland, uh, and these other these other kind of industrial uh, areas, um, just in large part because of our currency system. Wow. Okay. So you kind of what you want a you want a strong currency, but not too strong. Well, so that, that's the thing. I mean, ever since the 1970s, we're in these kind of ongoing currency wars. So it, it, if a currency is too weak, the downside is that, you know, the consumer, the consumers have less power, uh, purchasing power, and the, the country has trouble getting commodities, right? So you, you don't want to have a, a spiraling out of control weak currency. That, that's obviously terrible. On the other hand, if a currency gets too strong, uh, because of this, you know, because your liabilities and wages and, and you know your expenses are denominated in that currency, you can become less competitive compared to your global peers. And so, there are a number of countries that, at different times, purposely do currency manipulations to keep their currency, you know, down compared to the dollar uh, uh, by basically printing more currency units, buying res- foreign reserve assets, which can, which can include treasuries, it can include U.S. stocks, it can include all sorts of things like that, um, and it suppresses their currency. 
um, so that they can stay competitive and maintain their current uh, account surpluses or trade surpluses at the U.S.'s expense. Careful balance and act then. So <clears throat> just thinking about the, the U.S. stock market, uh, Danny, uh, you know, my producer, was working at this, and he was explaining to me the size of the U.S. stock market, which kind of blew me away. I had I had no idea. I, no one had ever put that into context for me, but he sent me this in. He said, the U.S. stock market capitalization currently represents 61% of global stock market capitalization. Like, can, you give, can you make sense of that for me? Yeah, so basically the United States is something like 23% of global GDP. So we're like, what, 4 or 5% of the population, 23% of global GDP, and 61% of global equity valuation. Uh, and so partially it's just because so much capital is stuffed in our equity markets that our stocks are quite expensive relative to foreign peers. And, you know, there's different different markets have different assets that are kind of overvalued. So, for example, our real estate market is not excessive compared to many other markets in the world. So Canada, Australia, uh, much of Europe, China, uh, many of those countries have more excessive housing valuations. Uh, that That's where they, they put a lot of their domestic capital into their housing markets. Whereas in the United States, I mean, we obviously, we ask, we obviously have cities that are expensive, but in aggregate, our housing valuations are not ridiculous compared to our peers. And instead, uh, it's our equity market. So Americans have higher equity allocations, and the rest of the world uh, puts a lot of their surplus dollars into our equity market. Uh, and so similar to, to the, around the year 2000, there's just so much capital shoved in the U.S. We saw a similar phenomenon back in the late 80s in Japan. There was actually a brief time where the Japanese equity market market capitalization was larger than the U.S. equity market capitalization. That was during that massive late 80s Japanese bubble. Um, and so that was an example of, of so much capital pouring into something relative to the size of its economy. And we basically have a similar phenomenon today, except it's, it's in some cases it's bigger because the United States is a larger part of global GDP and just so much capital has, has been kind of extracted from the rest of the world and shoved into U.S. equity uh, market cap. But surely the equity should represent something in you know, balance to the size of the businesses, uh, dividends it offers. Like, has all that, all those traditional valuations for equities gone out the window? Well, I mean, they they go out the window temporarily. So I guess the way I would describe it is the valuation tells you almost nothing about what returns are going to be like over the next couple of years. But it generally informs you uh, what returns are probably going to look like over a ten year period. Um, and so basically right now, say U.S. dividend yields are lower than most other foreign markets. Um, we're, the only time we had kind of a similar dividend yield was the dot-com bubble. Um, also price to sales, price to book, price to earnings, cyclically adjusted price to earnings, market capitalization as a percentage of GDP. All of those are elevated to very high levels, either the record highest they've ever been or the second highest they've ever been. Um, and it's partially because you know we have higher corporate uh, profit margins because of all these tax cuts that we've done for corporations, uh, but also just because of high valuations. And so, for example, you take a company like Costco, uh, they're a very big uh, retailer. They've been very successful. Um, they, they've grown a lot, but they also went from, you know, their stock trading at 25 times earnings uh, a decade ago to over 40 times earnings today. And so the stock price outperformed even the company itself and so just basically domestic and global investors are willing to pay very high multiples. One way I would describe it is that for lack of good money, we've monetized our large cap equities. Basically, you know, the whole world is dealing with these negative real rates. So so their their bonds and their cash are yielding below the prevailing inflation rate. So a lot of people don't want to use money or use currency as a store of value. And instead, one of the things that they use is large cap U.S. companies with smooth growth. And they just kind of say, you know what, I'm just going to pilot everything into that. I'm going to buy index funds. I'm just going to shove as much money as I can into equities because I'd rather store value there than in a bank account that yields, you know, half a percent while inflation is 7%. Okay, so that makes sense. But with the you know, U.S. equities that high, there must be some risk, some contagion risk for a significant drop. Absolutely. That's my that's my concern is that basically you can either have a significant drop or you can just go sideways for years, right? We, we had periods of time where equity markets just chop sideways, volatile pattern for years because eventually you pull so much capital in, you have to ask, where is the marginal buyer? If, if U.S. households already have record high allocation to equities, 
you know, who's going to be a, a, a further buyer of equities? If, if foreigners are already very overweight U.S. markets, who's going to be that marginal buyer? Now, it doesn't mean that this is the absolute top. You can always kind of find another, you can always scrape the bottom of the barrel and find another pool of capital somewhere that's a little under allocated and get, you know, even higher. Basically, for example, in, in say 1998, if you're talking about how high uh, valuations were, well, it's like, you know, another is going to run even higher over the next two years till 2000, right? So it's, it's very hard to call a top, but it's more like just pointing out that conditions are getting quite risky. And basically, for whatever reason, the U.S. equity market became less attractive to global investors. It could just because valuations become so heavy and they run out of marginal buyers. It could be because we do crackdowns on our big, uh, you know, tech companies. We want to say, kind of go after them for antitrust issues. Uh, it could be... Um, uh, just all sorts of reasons like that. If capital starts flowing out of the U.S. while we're also running a trade deficit, you could have a pretty sharp down move in the dollar and a, a sharp down move in U.S. equities compared to the rest of the world. Okay, uh, are we seeing that? Because I, I mean, I've not been close to it enough, Lim, but I did see like uh, the S and P got hit pretty hard in the last week. I've also noticed specific companies. I mean, Peloton had a complete and utter. Uh, shit show. Uh, Robin Hood's massively down from its launch. Netflix, I've seen, is down. Is this across the board? I mean, I see those because they're kind of stocks which are you know, close to the tech sector, which I'm I'm in. Uh, but is it has that has that been across the board? So we, we mostly yes, but we've seen kind of rotations. And so, for example, starting in February 2021. We saw a lot of the unprofitable hyper growth stocks. Uh, they peaked as a basket and started to roll over for about 11 months now, um, while the broader indices kept grinding up. So the the mega caps kept doing well uh, while the the, the hyper growth stocks started to roll over. Um, and what we saw since since the beginning of this year is that some of those really big ones started to roll over as well and show weakness. And it's interesting because value stocks held up better. So some of the less overvalued, um, uh, you know, uh, dividend paying stocks, slower growth companies, they did pretty well. And we actually saw emerging markets hold up a lot better uh, in this in this down move than U.S. stocks. Uh, so basically, we, we did see somewhat of a, a pullout of capital. Um, and so this was, in some cases, an unusual market move. Um, and it's, it's somewhat similar to, to how it looked in the really early 2000s after the dot-com bubble started to unwind. And it's too early to say if that's going to be part of a bigger move. Um, but it is, it is, I think, you know, a lot of macro people catch their attention when you see, for example, Brazilian stocks go up on a day where the S&P 500 has a massive down move. That, that's an unusual risk pattern that is, is noteworthy. Did you pull any of yours out? Did you put some money in Brazilian stocks? I am, I am long Brazilian equities. Um, uh, obviously, <laughs> you have to manage position sizes when you do that. Uh, it's a when can you manage my money? Market. Can I just send you all my money and manage it? I focus on research only because I'm, I'm busy Damn as it is. If Damn you start it, managing Lynn. client portfolios, it gets complicated. <laughs> I just want to match your portfolio. Um, okay, how did we get in this position? Is, is this all back to what the Bitcoiners keep talking about, which is you know cheap credit? A lot of it's cheap credit, and a lot of it's also design. So it goes back. I mean, the whole petrodollar system was designed. It was it was a purposeful decision uh, to engineer it the way they did. Uh, and so for the U.S. specifically. That was a policy that we started and that we still maintain. Um, but then more broadly, if you look at valuations across the board, yes, it was cheap credit. Uh, and it, it's this basically this modern central banking where whenever there's a crisis, we lower interest rates. Um, and that encourages more debt accumulation. And so we keep grinding down kind of the neutral level of interest rates. It's also, I think, partially a matter of just slowing demographics. And, and you know, so... People often point out that you know as debt increases, growth slows down. But it's also the other way around. As growth slows down, policymakers resort to more and more public debt uh, to try to offset that. Uh, and so basically, as kind of you know the demographics boom has slowed down, um, and and you know some of our systems were designed decades ago when we had faster population growth. And so now a lot of countries have these kind of top-heavy systems. And so when you look at say just overall how much debt's in the system, how low interest rates are. I do think we've had a lot of malinvestment. And then going back to what I talked about before, that for lack of good money, we monetize other things. We monetize, especially equities, uh, we monetize housing, right? So we buy a second home, uh, and instead of treating it like an investment, we're just kind of like, we'd rather have it there than in you know cash. 
Yeah, that's an uh, interesting position. I'm buying a new house at the moment, and there was a long period of consideration. It's like, well, shall I keep the second house? Is that a good place to store money? But I was like, no, I'm just I'm just going to buy more Bitcoin because uh, <laughs> that's where all my money goes. Yeah, in kind of a hard money environment, uh, generally, basically, you can store money in that money, and your investments would be more selective, right? So, so we have, you know, you've you've done a lot of due diligence in a weak money environment where your money does not maintain its purchasing power, there's an incentive to store your, your wealth in other assets. It, you know, it could be commodities, it could be companies, it could be real estate, whatever the case may be. And so because we've been in that environment, and it's specifically an accelerating environment, so lower and lower yields um, compared to inflation, we've just kind of stuffed everything we can into asset valuations. And where are we at with interest rates? Because um, uh, am I right in thinking there has been... Uh, an interest rate, is it two interest rate rises or has it been signaled a rise? In the United States, they've talked about raising interest rates. They've not done any interest rates yet. Yeah. So in emerging markets, they've been hiking rates all last year in many cases. Uh, so for example, Russia, Brazil, they've been increasing their interest rates dramatically. I mean, Brazil went from 2% to over 9% interest rates last year. Wow. Um, the UK did a very minor minor raise uh, and the US has not done any increases yet, um, but we're they're, they're looking to probably do it in March. Do they talk about it uh, as a necessity to talk about it or as a test of the reaction? Uh, so they, it's funny because the Fed does these forecasts. They they have these dot plots, which are generally not very accurate. Uh, they talk about forward guidance. And it, they've, they've also talked about how they want to roll out changes slowly because they don't want to, to disrupt capital markets. Um, and so over time, there's been a narrative shift in the Fed where they talked about, hey, we can maybe move forward rate hikes. And then when inflation's getting five, six, seven percent, they're like, hey, we're actually, you know, maybe we could do quantitative tightening. Maybe we can pull forward multiple rate hikes. So it's it's been this kind of the dials being turning up over time as headline inflation is surprising to the upside, uh, and they're getting political pressure uh, about, you know, kind of their their policies. So was it seven percent last month in uh, int- uh, inflation rate? Yeah, the headline CPI was seven point one percent year over year, which was the a forty year high, roughly. <laughs> and do we think uh, do you think that's going to flatline now, or do we think that's going to go higher? What's the talk on that? My base case is that by the end of the quarter, uh, that that has a good sign, a uh, good probability of topping out in year over year terms, um, and that's because some of the base effects start wearing off and. So we've seen this big surge in house prices and rent prices, and that's just you know the, the CPI version of that just starting to come in, yeah. Is, is kind of on a lag, and that that should mm-hmm. eventually catch up. But we're seeing kind of stabilization there. We also see a you know a pullback of fiscal stimulus, um, and so I, I do think that by the end of the quarter we could be looking at at kind of a you know a peak in year over year inflation. Um, uh, the caveat to that, so the risk to that outlook, let's say, what, what, would, what would have to happen for that not to happen? You'd have to see monthly acceleration, uh, monthly inflation accelerate, uh, which I think the, the biggest risk would be if energy if energy markets just go crazy, if energy has like a big shortage and it spikes, which is, a, is, a, is certainly a non-zero chance. Well, a, a war breaking out between Russia and Ukraine certainly won't be helpful for that. Exactly, yeah. There's a bunch of factors like that. We also just have low oil inventories uh, around the world in many cases. Um, and so we, we are at risk of a, an energy shortage. So, I mean, Europe's been going through that in terms of natural gas. And you could you could have a similar one for oil globally. And I don't know if it's, I think it's going to happen eventually. I don't know if it'll happen this year. Uh, but that's always on my radar for something that can cause uh, uh, inflation to remain high and go higher for longer than people think. But I think absent of an energy price spike, um, U.S. headline CPI has a good chance of kind of hitting a peak, but that doesn't mean it necessarily goes down quickly to its you know low levels. I mean, you can you can peak and then stay elevated, uh, kind of roll over and just remain high. So I get my gas and energy bills rolled into one here, and uh, this time last year, my rate my my spend would fluctuate between fifty and hundred pounds. So in the summer months around. 56 pound i think it was and in the winter months probably double that uh, just because of the house move i had to provide a uh, uh, they want a proof of address and you can use your utility bill so i went into uh, my energy company to download one and my uh, energy bill this month was 284 pounds and i've got no idea why if it's one of these things whereby like you tend to get an introductory rate and the, the best thing is to renew every year because if you renew every year, you get the, the new rate. And I don't know if I've gone into some kind of flexible rate, but my energy bills are essentially yeah, three times higher than they were a year ago, which is phenomenal. It was a £284 bill, 
which is about $350 for gas and electric for the month, which is phenomenally high. Whereas you, you usually you kind of plan for, you know, gas and electric for about 12 to 1500 pound a year have essentially over doubled on the pro rata rate. I, it really shocked me. Yeah. European and UK natural gas prices have been very elevated uh, due to shortages and that's challenging because natural gas is also a big component for electricity production uh, as well as fertilizers. Um, and so when you have that shortage, um, you get the, the spike in prices. And natural gas is, is challenging compared to oil because it's, it's harder to transport. It's more expensive to transport. Um, you have to you, have, you know liquefy natural gas or pipelines to transport it. And so, for example, oil, there's obviously different prices around the world. So, for example, Brent versus WTI crude, um, but the price differentials are usually not that big because the you know barrels of oil are rather mobile, uh, and so there's there's less differentiation around the world. It's closer to global commodity pricing, whereas natural gas is extremely location specific, um, and so you can have a natural gas spike in Europe. You know, there's a there's a brief period of time where European natural gas was 14 times higher than the United States European gas futures. Now, luckily that. That level of price differential didn't stay for long, but it's still several times higher than natural gas in the United States. Uh, and you know, partially, the United States is able to alleviate that because, for example, we we export liquefied natural gas, and we historically have uh, exported more towards Asia. But because Europe had a more severe price spike, a lot of our ships started going to Europe instead. So you have you have that price signal kind of uh, you know kind of self correcting itself by bringing in more supply. But because liquefied natural gas is, is technically complex, it takes a lot of infrastructure. Uh, you know, we only have limited capacity to do it, and that's that's why natural gas pricing is is more variable around the world compared to oil because there's only so much capacity to arbitrage those price differences. Well, there's a there's a lot of things happening at the same time in the UK. We've got high inflation. I think five point four percent was the last quoted time. We've also got taxes going up, uh, national insurance contributions are going up. Uh, I think the rise is about uh, if something like going up from twelve and a half to thirteen point eight percent or something. But it's about it's an over ten percent increase in that uh, happening. Uh, um, and obviously, energy prices are significantly higher, and that's putting a lot of pr political pressure on the Conservative government. I, 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 my expectation is we're almost certainly going to. Uh, we're going to see a transition to a Labour government, traditionally a little bit more socialist in the the next election. But these pr putting pressure, these similar pressures are happening all across Europe, um, and it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Because I think the government here are in a very tricky position with all of these factors coming in at the same time. Yeah, a lot of it is all these countries increased their money supply significantly, mm -hmm. uh, and that that caused a demand surge. Um, and even if a country did not do it, so for example, China did not rapidly increase their money supply, but they still have commodity shortages because if say Americans print a ton of money and buy a ton of commodities, you know, commodities are a global market. Uh, and so that, that can cause these global inflationary pressures. You don't, you, you know, so you, you don't just get localized inflation. Usually it, it kind of spreads around the world and rising, sharply rising food and energy prices are, uh, a big risk for social unrest uh, in many countries uh, and, and and are likely to cause political regime changes. And so that's something we're facing in the United States. It's something uh, you're facing in the UK. It's something obviously you're facing in many emerging markets. It's a really challenging uh, thing for a lot of them to deal with. And in Europe, I think, you know, part of the reason was they, uh, they, they've cut off some of their most reliable baseload power. So they've made themselves even more reliant on natural gas. Ger and then you have a shortage. Germany and nuclear. The nuclear exactly. situation in Germany is ridiculous. Yeah, it's basically it's it's you know like solar and wind is useful as a percentage of the grid, but if you if you have that as too high of an allocation, uh, you can get these shortages if you don't plan for it, if you don't have the storage for it, if you don't have these other you know these energy markets in place to kind of arbitrage those differences. You need a reliable baseload power, and ironically, I mean, basically with Germany shutting off nuclear, they made themselves more reliant on coal. They could have instead winded down coal. But instead, they wound, they wound down nuclear. Um, and you have basically just any any market that kind of goes after its baseload power and be becomes more reliant on imported power or on variable power sources puts themselves at risk for this. Crazy times. It's going to be a crazy. I think you said to me, like, inflation is going to be the topic of the next decade. I think there's it's going to be a 
I don't know. It feels like we've got a long road to recovery from these co- the COVID situation. Although uh, the only thing I would say on COVID, it feels like COVID is coming to an end in most places. I feel like in the UK, it certainly is. Is everyone's getting back on with their lives? But uh, the uh, I think the kind of hangover from COVID is is going to be lasting many years. I, I think so. And as we come out of COVID, um, that can exacerbate some of these commodity shortages, right? Yeah. So over the past decade. Commodities go in these big, like 10, 15 year capex cycles where you know they're oversupplied and so they're super cheap and nobody wants to put new capital, develop new mines, uh, new production. Then eventually, you know, demand keeps going up, supply eventually dwindles. Uh, we start to get tighter markets and we get this price spike. And a lot of policies and expectations have recency bias built into them. So they assume that whatever's happening now and over the past five to 10 years is that way forever. So whenever we have these low, these cheap commodity environments, oversupply, people kind of think we've, we've, we've reached like the end of commodity scarcity. We've kind of solved our scarcity. We have limit, limitless abundance. We have no inflationary pressures. But inevitably, when that tighter commodity cycle comes, less CapEx goes into developing new sources, you get that, 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 uh, you know, that increase in price. And so the past five years, we've been in this commodity oversupply environment. And going forward, commodity markets look a lot tighter. And so you can have years where they go down, right? It's not like a straight line. You can have these, you know, economic decelerations and accelerations. But in general, we're in a tighter market for supply of energy and other commodities. And, you know, basically politicians are going to find themselves in a tough position where if they want to fight that inflation, they have to pull back on things that stimulate demand. Uh, But then, then you can get you know, uh, slower growing or outright recessionary economies, which people don't like, or they can keep their foot on the gas and keep that demand high, but then they have high inflation. And so you see uh, issues where, for example, people have those energy those energy bills skyrocketing. So some countries, uh, they, they give people money to, you know, ener- energy like uh, stimulus to basically help help people pay, which makes sense because I mean, people are literally getting their, you know, their, 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 uh, budget gets squeezed, so the government comes in and helps them. But that basically also keeps demand high, and and is kind of part of this inflationary cycle. And so, you know, it's it's kind of like grass is always greener, right? So if if they don't stimulate, people are going to be like, oh, the economy is sluggish. Like the government should do something. And if they do stimulate, people are going to say, well, where's all this inflation coming from? This inflation is too high. And a lot of it's it's it's, it's partially tied to the money supply, and it's also that the commodity resource cycle we're going through, as well as political decisions around. Uh, the quality of energy. Can we, I want to touch on recycled trade deficits, but just before we get into that, because it'd be useful for people listening to understand, I know some people understand what trade deficits are, but can, can you explain it again, what a trade deficit are deficit is and you know the Im- impact of having like a positive or negative trade deficit? Sure. So basically if a, if a country imports more than it exports, uh, then it's running a trade deficit. And so, I mean, you can use an example of, say, two neighbors, right? So if, if, if there's two neighbors and, you know, one of them is, say, elderly and the other one does a bunch of services for them, right? So they mow their lawn, they clean their pool, they, you know, they help them out. So they're basically having a, a services surplus. So that, you know, trade is both goods, physical goods and services. Could be software, could be finance, could, you know, different services. And so in that in that case of those two neighbors, the younger neighbor is helping out the older neighbor uh, in exchange for some sort of payment, right? And, and so uh, they can say, take those dollars, and let's say you know they they buy part of their land, so they you know the younger neighbor expands his land into that other uh, person's property because they they you know they're basically getting a surplus. Then they go ahead and they buy their shed, they buy their pool, and it's kind of like over time that that second home is kind of encroaching on the other home. Because the first home is selling away part of its assets in order to pay for that consumption, and we so that's generally what happens when you run a trade deficit. So if a country runs a, a, a consistent trade deficit, so let's say the United States runs a trade deficit, which is what we're doing ever since we introduced the petrodollar system. So foreigners are, in, in aggregate, collecting dollar surpluses. So China, Germany, Japan, uh, Singapore, Switzerland, Taiwan. You know these countries are running these these structural trade surpluses. They're getting all these excess dollars, and then they take those dollars and they buy U.S. assets with them. So they could you know they could buy U.S. Treasuries like you know paper 
liabilities uh, for them that are assets, or they can go and buy hard assets. They can buy our land. They can buy our real estate. They can buy our, our shares of corporations. So they own a bigger percentage of Apple. They own a bigger percentage of our land. They own a bigger percentage of our single family homes. And so, for example, decades ago, foreigners owned maybe three or four percent of our of our U.S. equity market, but now they own twenty or twenty five percent, depending on how you measure it, of our U.S. equity market. So basically, we are we are running a deficit in terms of you know we're we're buying more depreciating consumer assets from the rest of the world, and in exchange, they're taking those dollars and they're buying our permanent appreciating assets. So is that how China is? managed to buy up so you know we've got a uh, a massive amount of say property which is being bought in london by chinese buyers is that is that why that happens yes yeah basically they're 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 taking all these surplus dollars also the uk usually runs a trade deficit as well so they're you know they're taking their pounds uh, and then they cycle those back into those countries uh and so they end up owning a larger percentage of of those kind of desirable financial assets uh, due to due to the fact that they're running these manufacturing surpluses and that they're selling more to the UK and more to the United States uh, than we are selling to them. Right, and this is why uh, interest rates are so important. Yes, uh, interest rates are important as well as capital flows, and and then it's it's more complicated because you know countries then have you know liabilities denominated in other currencies as well, and so you can get these weird you know. Let's say Brazil, for example. So Brazil has a lot of dollar-denominated debt, right? So they owe dollars. And what's unintuitive is the fact that they don't necessarily even owe those dollars to Americans. They can owe those dollars to to European lenders. They can owe those dollars to Chinese lenders, Japanese lenders, right? So in fact, most of it is not owed to the U.S. Um, so they owe dollars to someone in the world. And if the dollar strengthens, uh, basically imagine like you take out a, a mortgage in Swiss francs, right? And the Swiss well, francs goes leverage. up. It's, it's it's basically leverage. It's leverage in a currency they don't control. Uh, and so, for example, yeah, if you if you mortgage your house in Swiss franc, uh, so you had you 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 know your cash flows are in dollars or pounds, and your liabilities are in franc. And if the franc goes up relative to dollars or pounds, your debts just increased relative to your asset values and your asset and your incomes. That's a problem. And so, Brazil, if they have all this dollar based debts and the dollar strengthens relative to other currencies, especially the Brazilian real, they basically get quantitative tightening. They're basically being squeezed. Their liabilities are increasing in, in value compared to their, uh, you know, their, their income compared to their asset values. And so uh, that can be very problematic for them. And so that's why emerging markets go through these huge boom-bust cycles because so many of them have these dollar-dominated debts. And so they get squeezed by what happens to the dollar, which they have nothing to do with. And so it's really funny. So, for example, let's say Chinese, they have all these dollar surpluses. If they decide to put all that capital in the U.S., uh, that's going to prop up the value of the dollar, uh, and that's going to squeeze Brazil, right? So you have these weird dynamics that happen around the world. If all this capital shoves into the dollar, if everybody wants to buy the NASDAQ, that actually hurts Brazil. Uh, but then um, if, say, people pull out of the NASDAQ and the dollar weakens, Brazil gets a reprieve from their, you know, their, their liabilities decrease in value or they ease up a little bit. And that allows you know Brazil to have some breathing room in terms of expansion. And so part of the downside of having one country's currency as kind of this, you know, the asset that we use for both, you know, central bank reserve assets as the treasury and as, you know, the the big liability uh, around the world that, that all these countries have is that as that currency attracts or loses capital, it causes these booms and busts in these emerging markets. And it's just a really improperly designed system. Well, which is why it makes sense, really, what Bukele's doing with El Salvador, giving himself some protection against uh, what may happen with the U.S. dollar. Yeah, I mean, it's especially it's problematic for you know dollarized countries that are not the United States have challenges because you know they're operating in a, for them it's a hard currency because they can't print it right. So they're they're you know mm. for them it's this hard currency, and if the U.S. stimulates right, so if the U.S. hands out stimulus checks to all its citizens. Uh, the dollar gets devalued, but El Salvadorians don't benefit from that, uh, you know, other than the fact that they might get some increased remittances from their American relatives. But other than that, they have they have no mechanism to benefit from those stimulus, um, and so they get devalued. Um, and at the same time, you know they're they're just they have less kind of ability to manage their own currency supply. And so basically, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender 
can increase their money supply because it brings in another type of currency they can work with. Um, and it also gives us El Salvadorians a chance to save in a currency that, you know, over the long run uh, is probably expected to, in, you know, hold its value better than the dollar. Uh, and so they don't they don't keep getting their savings devalued by Americans choosing to stimulate themselves. And it's just, you know, but whether whether an emerging market is dollarized or whether they're they're running their own currency, but they have dollar based debts, they all get impacted by what happens both in terms of U.S. policy and in terms of foreign capital flows into and out of the U.S. So it basically is, it's a, you know, if this was an engineering system, it would be considered a rather sloppy uh, and, and harmful system for a lot of uh, participants. Yeah. What did you make of the IMF telling El Salvador, as El Salvador to remove Bitcoin as legal tender? Did you see that? Yeah, they keep saying that. They don't go into d- detailed reasons why. Um, and, you know, the IMF is one of the kind of the, the, you know, establishment forces that maintained this big system we just talked about, this this kind of wacky capital flow US dollar centric system. And so they have a they have kind of an incentive to maintain it. Now, the, the the risk for El Salvador, the biggest risk that I see is that ever since they, you know, basically, you know, around the time they announced the Bitcoin legal tender law, also a little bit before then, uh, due to some of uh, kind of the you know, kind of the authoritarian tendencies that they were kind of uh, developing, but you know, it mainly was centered around the Bitcoin law. Foreign markets started selling off El Salvador's sovereign bonds, and so yep. the yields went up dramatically. And the problem is, if they want to over time refinance as as those debts come due, and if they want to roll those debts into new debts, they have to have to agree to much higher yields. And once you get a double digit yields, you you get into a fiscal spiral, right? That's not really economic to do and so you can you can have a you can have a real default risk if you were if, if the if the rest of the world does not want to buy your sovereign bonds and so you know basically you can consider it unfair but basically for whatever reason the, the world has kind of sold off their bonds uh, compared to their peers uh, and so they do have a refinancing risk I mean that 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 can be why they're turning into volcano bonds and really in the long run the only way that they can address that is by showing that the policy is working, right? So if they start getting GDP surprises to the upside due to either increased tourism uh, or due, due to a high domestic investment, basically businesses and people want to spend capital there, if they start to do well economically, the bond market should realize, oh, wait, this, this sell-off was irrational. Uh, we actually don't mind owning El Salvador bonds compared to some of the peers. Um, or if the policies don't work out for one reason or another, you can get that pretty bad fiscal spiral. So the IMF can go and say, "Oh, look, look at this Bitcoin legal tender law; it's hurting you. Uh, you should you should abandon it." But it's not it's not directly the Bitcoin legal tender law that's doing it. It's the fact that the global market has decided not to buy their bonds. So that's kind of the big challenge for them at the moment. So it looks like I'm just tracking here. It looks like El Salvador's GDP from 1965 under a billion, but it's been a pretty up straight up line from year 2000. It was 11.78 billion up until 2019 of 20, nearly 27 billion, but it dropped last year to 24 billion. Now, my first thing would would be to go and look at everyone's and see if that's a you know is that a COVID anomaly uh, that's hit them last year. Do we know that? Uh, most countries uh, out in denominated dollars did have their GDP drop in 2020, yes. Right, okay, so that would be for that. And I guess we'll have to, there's no way of like objectively knowing. Is there any other way you can measure GDP apart from this and account for that anomaly? Uh, that's the main way. You can compare it to peers. And so, for example, if you look at Guatemala, yeah, uh, their GDP is, has been holding up better than El Salvador's through this environment, as an example, as one data point. Right. So you can you can go and look at a bunch of other peer countries and see how they're doing. Um, obviously, El Salvador was stressed, you know, before the Bitcoin legal tender law, but their bonds were not. I mean, their bonds were trading at par, right? But the country had its own problems, um, and so I think basically, you know, the bond market is going to watch El Salvador and see what happens with their economy and and you know their their judgment of their ability to have persistent tax revenue, support the bonds, uh, and it becomes like a self feedback loop, right? So the the better the bonds consider El Salvador's prospects of paying back the bonds, the lower the yields will be, and that that further increases their ability to pay back the bonds. Whereas if they judge El Salvador as being weak and they sell off the bonds, it contributes to the fact that the, it makes it even likely that they'll be able to pay back, pay back the bonds. And so it's really going to depend on that, on GDP growth, and on whether or not El Salvador is successful 
with these other types of bonds that they're looking to issue. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what happens with this first Volcano bond. I don't know how close it is to to being available to buy. It maybe it already is. I have no idea. I've not looked. Have you looked much at it now? I, I did look it up uh, before, and I also talked to Adam back about it. We were both on Swan okay. Signal, so we discussed it. We also discussed it privately a little bit ahead of that, just to uh, see if we're on the same page. And so, I mean, I I think the plan makes sense. And if anything, this this Bitcoin sell off, uh, you know, they it's great I'm, for them. They would prefer to buy low. Of um, I think Samson Mao pointed that out. Um, so um, hopefully they get in uh, on this low point, and hopefully Bitcoin does have a good five plus year return prospect which could help El Salvador over time. The challenge is that generally you want to see this oversubscribed because you want to see that they, okay, they can raise it again in the future because some of their debt comes due prior to five years from now. Um, right. And so they, you know, it's, it's not just the ultra long term that matters to them. It's, it's, it's about the near term. Um, and so, you know, Bitcoiners can s- support them by, you know, traveling there, by investing there, um, but of course, there there is ethical issues around how the re- how the regime is handling, uh, you know, some of their governance, right? So I think there are legitimate questions yep. about that that have to be have to be watched. So I think people have to be careful about drinking the Kool Aid, so to speak, right? So so always be sober minded when analyzing, uh, you know, these regimes uh, and these these kind of policies. Don't necessarily support things just because they're Bitcoiners, and don't oppose things just because they're not Bitcoiners. Always kind mm-hmm. of assess things objectively as, as possible. I would say I I discussed the same thing with Matt O'Dell in our like end of year review. It's kind of like uh, have we perhaps maybe given Bukele a pass as a Bitcoiner? You know, he's great at memes. He's put his McDonald's hat on and he's you know very much acting like a Bitcoiner. But d- does that mean we've essentially given him a pass? Should we be asking tougher questions? I know Alex Gladstein has. Uh, and it's you know it's one of those difficult things. Even myself, difficult as somebody who's interviewed him twice and wants a third interview. You know, I want to continue having that relationship to talk to him. But you know, what is the cost of that? You know, should we be asking much tougher questions? And yeah, it's definitely something that's been on my mind. And I'm glad you raised it. I agree because he, I mean, he's clearly intelligent. Uh, he's clearly he he has he he has his finger on the pulse of the Bitcoin community. He has his meme game uh, strong. Um, and I do think that that aspects of the Bitcoin legal tender law are useful for El Salvador. I think it's a, you know, it's kind of a, you know, he he took risks in doing this. You know, he basically he, mm, he, he disturbed the yeah he disturbed the apple cart, the IMF, and the global perception of their bonds. Um, and so he's kind of gone all all in on this. And so for the people of El Salvador, I want it to be successful. Uh, for the perception of the Bitcoin network, I'd like it to be successful. Um, but I, I do think also it's important to monitor for uh, areas of risk. Uh, I think the, the biggest one is the sovereign bond yield issue. Uh, and two, uh, you know, to not necessarily support um, uh, regimes or actions, in, maybe individual actions that are, are unethical. So I think, it, I think the, the community should hold them to account. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I do also think at the same time, he it's been very interesting where they've moved their COVID strategy. In some ways, it's very much reflecting what maybe some of the Bitcoin people have been saying, which is, you know, it's more about health. And should we be promoting, uh, um, uh, it's like pu- public health policy, should we be promoting better exercise diet and body conditioning to protect yourself from um, you know, the risks of something like COVID, which I, I think is a very interesting shift from you know, when previously during COVID, you know, I traveled over there and they had just tighter restrictions than other countries. They seem to have uh, shifted their policy partly on that, which I, I found kind of kind of interesting, but all, all to be seen how that plays out. Okay, look, back to the equity markets. Uh, have we got any risks here, Lynn? Have we got any risks that we have a you know, Great Depression to? Well, Great Depression to parse depends on policy choices, right? So basically, if you had equity markets sell off and central banks do nothing and then at, you know asset prices go viciously downward, you have a, a, a massive kind of a deleveraging of everything, uh, you would have you know, widespread bank defaults. Um, but generally, uh, when you start to get those illiquid conditions, you know they basically come in and, 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 and prop it up. So basically, the, the challenge that central banks face around the world is death by ice or fire. Right. So do you want things to unravel in a deflationary collapse or do you want to keep stoking the fire of inflation um, by printing currency units to maintain uh, you know, the status quo? 
And so in history, the vast majority of, of fiat currency regimes die by fire, not by ice. You know, when a push comes to shove, they print. Um, and it's one of those things where if they don't print, ironically, you still get inflation. It just it's it's like a different route, right? Basically, you you would have a deflationary collapse until the currency is useless, and then it hyperinflates, right? So it, it all you know kind of leads in the end towards weaker currency, and there's just different paths to get there and different timelines to get there. Um, my base case is I, I view each market separately, right? So mm-hmm. so the I think the risk the the biggest risk going forward as I see it is stagflation. Right, so so basically, where countries are trying to maintain positive GDP growth and trying to manage high inflation, uh, and 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 having say energy shortages, I think energy shortages are going to be one of the keys. If we have a really tough decade ahead, I think a lot of it's going to be tied into whether or not we have abundant energy or not. And so, if we have energy scarcities, and if we have kind of these policies of energy run up into physical reality. Um, I, I think you can get some pretty bad outcomes. And so I, I would watch energy markets uh, pretty closely. Okay. Well, definitely as someone in Europe, uh, I, for many reasons, I, I hope the uh, situation in Russia and uh, Ukraine uh, de-escalates because I think that will almost certainly drive the energy crisis in Europe further. So yeah, I'm definitely watching that. Okay. So what does this, what's this all mean for Bitcoin, Lim? Because uh, we ov- obviously a lot of Bitcoiners want uh, – they don't want Bitcoin to be correlated with the equity markets. And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But it, it feels like more often it is than it isn't. Um, what are you seeing? So Nidig had a really good chart the other day that showed that from 2011 to 2019, Bitcoin was not super correlated with equities. There are, there are periods where it was, there are periods where it wasn't. Whereas ever since early 2020, it's been a lot more positively correlated with the equity market, U.S. equity market in particular. Um, and... Uh, part of that, I think, is because of institutional adoption. Uh, I think another part of it is because of stimulus. Almost everything became correlated, uh, except for, like, say, fiat and gold, right? So most other assets just all went up together, so everything became positively correlated. Um, another thing to look at is that – so we've we've historically pointed out that you know a lot of Bitcoiners are familiar with the fact that Bitcoin generally does well after having – happens, right? The, the bull runs happen after halvings. Another correlation is that all the major bull markets, so 2011, 2013, uh, you know, uh, 2016, 2017, and 2020 into 2021, those were rising uh, PMI environments, uh, purchasing managers indices, which is a measure of whether an economy is, the, the, gro- the growth is accelerating or decelerating. Um, and so, the you know, the, a, a PMI averages around 50, and if it's above 50, it means it's expanding. And if it's the higher above 50 it is, the more rapidly it's expanding. And so when you have a declining PMI, it could still be that your economy is growing, but it's growing at a slower rate. And so generally, you know, all those bull markets occur during accelerating economic growth, um, whereas the, the bear markets are generally, you know, kind of flat to decelerating growth uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and generally kind of the Western world in general. And so Bitcoin has been a traditionally risk-on asset for a lot of its period. Now, that correlation is a lot different if you look at, say, emerging markets, right? So if you look at Brazilian equities or Turkish equities or Chinese equities, you'll have a lot less positive correlation with Bitcoin. So for them, Bitcoin is a diversifier in many cases. Okay, it's yeah. just that, especially for American investors, it's not necessarily been this hedge or this this uh, uh, uncorrelated asset. It's been this correlated asset. But – as it goes through these cycles, because of the qualities it has, it builds this value over time, at least historically. Uh, and so it's been positively correlated, but stronger. So how are you feeling about Bitcoin this year? Like, and Last year was a weird year, Lid, and, and it was like no other year. And, and I think it's good that it, is, it was like no other year because these predictable kind of market cycles, actually, I, I don't think are particularly useful. Uh, and in some ways, like... The, I know some people wanted a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, and I understand why they thought it might happen. I'm kind of glad it didn't happen. I I would much rather steady growth, but I also because we didn't have that, I don't feel like we're going to have to head to this like eighty percent drawdown this year. I I feel like almost Dan's kind of super cycle, like or lengthening cycle, is something we're headed into. Yeah, my base case is for a, a, sl- a, a, a less of a drawdown because there's less of a blow off top as well, mm-hmm. and so I've I've been say, less bullish than some of the bulls, but less bearish than some of the bears when it comes to Bitcoin. So, for example, 
you know, I was calling for Bitcoin to reach a trillion dollar market cap. We got there. Uh, I, I, you know, I said that I eventually I, I see it over, uh, you know, 100,000. We didn't get there yet, but I've not been, you know, kind of calling for near term kind of 200 or 300,000 as, as some of the really big bulls are. But at the same time, I'm not expecting it to, to drop down 80 or 85 percent like some of the prior bear markets did. Uh, now, it's certainly possible you can have a liquidity event that really drives that down. You have a leveraged capitulation. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd probably be a buyer of that. that. That would look like a good opportunity to me. Uh, but it's not necessarily something I'm expecting or, or looking at as a base case. And generally, my expectation is kind of intermediate term, kind of neutral, because we have that declining PMI environment for 2022 uh, in the U.S. So it's it's not a you know it's not a risk on environment for for most assets at least as far as it's looking now. Uh, so I think that can give headwinds to Bitcoin. One way I would describe it is that so if you look at demand. You know, demand for Bitcoin really peaked back in the first quarter of 2021 when we had that initial uh, sharp rise. And ever since then, demand's been weaker. So you've seen that come up in terms of lower on-chain fees. For example, uh, you, you can look at on-chain indicators and see there's less demand, new demand flowing into it. At the same time, the supply side's been very tight. So we have we have a different market structure in this cycle compared to prior cycles. So there's more people dollar cost averaging into it. Miners are holding on to a lot of their own coins. Uh, people have more of a price issue to look at and want to hodl it, uh, so more conviction. So the supply side has been extraordinarily tight, uh, while the demand side's lacking. And so basically, I think you know, for, from for you know the rest of this year, I think a lot of it's going to depend on how strong that dollar cost averaging group is, um, and and things like that. And the next big leg up comes whenever you have a risk on environment and new demand comes in. Uh, towards that very, very tight supply. So I think we basically have this kind of dry kinder, uh, Kindle environment where you know there's there's basically a catalyst for a big move up, but there's no spark. There's no kind of inflow of demand. And you would need to see that to have the next you know giant leg up. Awesome. All right, listen, that was, uh, as ever, it's amazing. I'm glad we've, uh, we can let people know we're going to be working together again this year, which is awesome. Um, Looking forward to making a bunch more shows with you, Lynn. Anyone listening, go and sign up to our newsletter. Lynn always hates me saying this, but I don't care. It's amazing. It's the best two hundred dollars you'll spend a year. Did you raise the price? No. It's, it's ridiculous. I'm keeping it accessible. Well, I think it's accessible at four hundred dollars, but I think you're amazing for it anyway. Go and sign up. It's in the show notes. Go and check it out, Lynn. Always love talking to you, and I will see you in February. Sounds good. Take care. Thank you.